Today, we bring forward a very somber topic where solutions have seemed, at least for the last six years, elusive. It is the topic of Yemen. I'll share my screen. And the crisis that has gripped Yemen and seems to be escalating uh, at a rate that is, um, that is almost beyond comprehension. This will be a very somber discussion and I think very sobering as we bring forward two of the uh, most prominent experts in the space to talk about the immediate crisis as it has deepened even in very recent days. And as we talk about the historical context and what has led to this crisis and what has created the situation that is indeed seemingly intractable. And then in the spirit of our conference, we hope to be able to talk about potential solutions wherever they might lie, even where they might seem wholly inadequate relative to the challenges in play. We hope to be able to bring forward the solutions that have, that have been introduced in a US congressional context, for example, and elsewhere as we contemplate the future outlook for what has been deemed the world's most pressing humanitarian crisis. We'll also examine issues of responsibility and complicity amid the involvement of many actors and ample layers of complexity. And to bring us uh, into this complexity, we have I, I am very pleased today that we have with us two of the most prominent voices and experts on the Yemen crisis. And uh, given the, the, I think the very distressing nature of some of what we'll talk about, and given that it's prone to spark debate, we've opted to actually close the chat in this meeting and focus questions to a designated email inbox. We hope that you'll engage with us through this inbox so that we can have a dynamic Q&A as I'm sure we will. With us today, we have US Representative Ro Khanna, who represents the 17th District of California, where I'm very happily situated. I know um, speaking every day and spending time every day with constituents of Representative Khanna, I know how much admiration they have for him, in part because of his leadership with respect to the humanitarian nightmare that is Yemen. For years now, with a special quality of endurance, Representative Khanna has led the US and led his, uh, the House of Representatives and his capacity to be able to bring forward important pieces of legislation that have kept a spotlight on Yemen where it has continued to slip outside of international attention. We're extremely privileged to have him with us today in part because recent developments uh, in Yemen, even over the past few days, have precipitated further response from Congress, which Representative Khanna has again led. So a very special opportunity for us today to hear from Representative Khanna, to be able to hear his commentary on especially what has happened over the last week and to offer us a view into what's happening from a specific US political lens. And, in, and from a more panoptic lens, we have with us Asher Orkabi, who is a foremost scholar on Yemen. Here are two of his recently published books, published in the last few years, both of them centered on Yemen. I've had the, the distinct pleasure of being a student of Professor Orkabi uh, in, in past years. And I can promise you that where conflict is concerned, where there is deep historical context to be elucidated and where there are many layers of complexity at play, Professor Orkabee is gifted in his ability to be able to illuminate that complexity and bring a special clarity into view where only confusion would otherwise reign. Uh, here you can see the books and I hope that you'll pick them up. Yemen, What Everyone Needs to Know. I had the opportunity to be able to read this recently and I hope that we'll be able to dive into some of its parts, especially as they pertain, for example, to Houthi rebels and their, and their genesis. Uh, and you also see here Beyond the Arab Cold War, the International History of the Yemen Civil War, 1962 to 1968, a specific point in time that continues to bring a certain shadow to the Yemeni conflict that we see today. We'll start the conversation by turning the time over to Congressman Khanna to speak about the Yemeni conflict 
his own political journey as he has carried the banner on Yemen in the House of Representatives, the work that he's done within Congress and now with the Biden administration. Certainly there have been moments of hope uh, as recently as February of this year, where it looked like there were breakthroughs in play. And yet now we see further distress and, and, and further chaos, we might argue, um, in, the, in the wake of last week's events. So we'll turn the time over first to Congressman Khanna, and then we'll look to Professor Orkaby to share with us that deep historical context that can bring that clarity that I mentioned. And then we'll move into a Q&A session that I, again, I hope will be dynamic. And I hope you will use this special inbox for this special conversation. So with that, Congressman Khanna, let's turn it to you. Can you offer your reflections on the state of Yemen today and the work that you are doing uh, to be able to offer or present some sort of resolution uh, as we move forward, um, as the world moves forward and watches in a state of horror at what is happening. Congressman Khanna. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I uh, will be brief uh, because I'd rather hear from the experts, but I'll certainly share uh, what we're doing. And thank you to uh, Professor uh, Padre for uh, inviting me. He's helped me understand John Rawls, but I am happy to uh, share uh, reflections on, on Yemen. Uh, let me uh, say what I see as the beginning of the U.S. Uh, complicity in, in Yemen. When President Obama started to uh, engage with Iran uh, in uh, the uh, nuclear deal, which was, in my view, a great feat of diplomacy, uh, the Saudis were uh, very disturbed. They were disturbed about our engagement uh, with Iran. And at the time, uh, we basically uh, agreed to support uh, their war uh, in Yemen, in part uh, as a balancing of our uh, approach to Iran, uh, which in my view is one of the fundamental uh, problems with American foreign policy in, in the region, uh, this view that we have to somehow balance uh, different powers uh, in uh, seeking uh, American interests, that we want to prevent uh, a a uh, hegemon from uh, emerging has led to the uh, overlooking of human rights, the overlooking of uh, the types of democracy uh, reforms that we want to support. And that was the initial miscalculation. Uh, the, the administration ended up regretting, in my view, the war uh, by the end of uh, Obama's term. Uh, they uh, probably uh, would have started to wind it down, the support, uh, if it weren't for uh, the election of Donald Trump, who comes in uh, and really tilts American foreign policy uh, very much in a direction that is uh, pro-Saudi uh, and uh, basically doubles down on U.S. support uh, for the war. Now, I'm not uh, holding the, the, the Houthis blameless. Obviously, they have had their share a blame in, in the conflict, but it's important to realize that the U.S. involvement has been uh, in fueling the Saudi-led uh, efforts. So what we have control over is our support of uh, the Saudis. We don't have really control over the Houthis. And the people who I've talked to in the region believe that if we could get the foreign intervention out, if we could stop the U.S. Uh, proxy support, the Saudi proxy support, uh, the Iranian proxy support, that is the best chance to have a peaceful diplomacy. And uh, our role, of course, has been uh, fueling uh, the Saudis. Uh, Senator Sanders and I then led a war powers resolution in around 2017. Uh, it didn't gain much traction, but after Khashoggi's murder, uh, the sentiment in the US changed. And we were able to pass the war powers resolution for the first time in our country's history. Uh, in, uh, uh, since 1973, since the War Powers was uh, introduced. Even though Trump vetoed that resolution, he voluntarily suspended the refueling. If you talk to Martin Griffiths, who was the UN envoy, this in part led to the ceasefires, ceasefire in uh, Hodeida. Mattis, the defense secretary at the time, uh, used the, uh, what was happening in Congress to put pressure uh, on the Saudis to say you have to start coming to, to the table. So Trump had uh, you know, already voluntarily suspended the refueling uh, when Biden then took office. Uh, 
Biden went further and he said, well, we, we have to lift the blockade. Uh, the uh, Saudis have been basically blockading uh, uh, the uh, entry of commercial uh, activity into Yemen, uh, preventing oil, which has led to huge inflation, uh, preventing some food and medicine. They claim it's to, uh, to prevent weapons from getting in. Uh, but what we have said is you could have an international organization or so, anyone other than the Saudis uh, doing the monitoring. And so uh, there needs to be a lifting off the blockade, uh, and in my view, frankly, a judgment that the Saudis have lost uh, lost the war. President Biden came in and he took a constructive step. He said, we're going to formally uh, stop any uh, refueling of, uh, of planes that are engaged in offensive strikes in, in uh, Yemen, that we're not going to be aiding in even intelligence in, in, in those strikes. Uh, but he's been unable uh, so far to get uh, the Saudis to either recognize that they've lost the war uh, or to uh, lift the blockade, despite uh, many, many months of uh, efforts. The Saudis say that they're being attacked, uh, which is true. I mean, that there have missiles being launched into the, the, uh, in the kingdom, but there hasn't been a single casualty. And, and my view is that uh, those attacks would stop uh, if the Saudis uh, ended the war. Now, there's still obviously the problem of Marib and displacement and Houthis uh, moving there. But in my view, if we lift the blockade uh, and if we uh, end uh, the Saudi involvement, it will give the UN and peacekeepers the best chance of having a um, peace agreement in, in Yemen uh, and, a human, and a solution to the humanitarian crisis. So finally, we've then, Senator Sanders and I have introduced an amendment which would basically uh, prohibit uh, any spare parts going to the Saudis. Uh, it would uh, ground potentially the Saudi Air Force uh, to a halt, the part of the Air Force at least that's engaged in offensive strikes because they're dependent on our tires, they're dependent on many of our spare parts. Uh, this amendment was supported by Jake Sullivan and Anthony Blinken uh, when they uh, were not in the administration. It passed last year, but was stripped from the Senate in. Uh, conference in the National Defense Authorization. This year it has passed the House. Uh, we're working to get the support of the administration. The administration says the facts have changed. The Houthis are more aggressive. Uh, and so the, they are not uh, committed yet to supporting an amendment, which in their private capacity, they supported uh, last cycle or last year. Uh, and the question is whether that amendment will pass. Uh, the consideration of that amendment, of course, has given the administration more leverage to try to push the Saudis, uh, but so far there has been no, no breakthrough. So that is a sort of a summary of where things are from a con Congress perspective. Okay, great, wow. So Professor Orkaby, we'll turn it over to you, certainly offer any reflections on what we just heard from uh, Congressman Khanna, and then to, perhaps move into your presentation and to share more about the history and the context in, that we're probing this morning. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamie and Professor Pog. And, uh, and also uh, for Congressman Khanna, uh, I really appreciate as a first generation Yemeni American, my father was born and raised in Yemen. Uh, the country is really dear and close to my heart. And to know that there are those on, on Capitol Hill who are interested in, in uh, resolving the conflict and who care about Yemen is, is very heartening. So thank you for, for your time and dedication to uh, the conflict in Yemen. And I, I hope we'll, we'll have more opportunity to work together to uh, bring a, a peaceful resolution. So uh, with, with that uh, in mind, I wanted to, to shift our focus a bit. And uh, in, in some ways it's really uh, easy. And this is a classic, uh, uh, perhaps an American or, or European centric, where it's easy to divide the world almost into two uh, and, and to take a regional crisis and divide into Saudi Iranian conflict. But as Congressman Khanna said, it's really about Yemen and about the Yemeni people. And I think if, if we take a, we shift our lens a little bit to focus a little bit more on, on Yemen itself and what is actually happening in the conflict, maybe we can think uh, collectively about different ways to bring out a solution or a resolution. Uh, so of, of course the, uh, most visible image of Yemen over the past five years has been related to the humanitarian disaster. So how how did this happen? So uh, it's important to understand it's caused not by natural disaster or, or famine, 
Uh, but it's a combination of, of the Saudi blockade, internally displaced persons and refugees, uh, active fighting on the ground, uh, corruption that's rampant across the country, uh, and really a growing national dependence on humanitarian aid. But uh, this dire humanitarian uh, situation in Yemen, is, it's not solely a consequence of war and violence, but it's also uh, a consequence of decades long uh, culmination of, uh, of resource and, uh, and infrastructure mis mismanagement and neglect that's been rampant all across Yemen. Uh, so uh, before we jump into solutions for the humanitarian aid, uh, let's see where Yemen, how Yemen got to this uh, situation uh, where uh, there is a humanitarian crisis uh, on our hands. So it's important to understand the conflict doesn't start in 2014 when the Houthi tribal militias, or the Houthi militias take over the capital city of, of Sana'a. Rather, it's a culmination of a, of a civil war that began during the 1960s. So for the past 50 years, uh, Yemen has been, uh, or from 1962 rather to 2012, there, there was a central group of a revolutionary generation that ran Yemen, uh, that uh, the modern republic was founded by this group of, of famous 40 and all their uh, accolades uh, in 1962. And for 50 years, uh, constituted a main civil service and really the ruling legitimacy for this uh, state. Uh, the uh, revolutionary generation, as I've um, termed them, uh, also served as the unifying force for uh, a unification of North and South Yemen in 1990. But in 2012, uh, one of the uh, last members of this revolution, revolutionary generation uh, Abdul, Abdul Ghani uh, dies in 2012. There's a massive funeral. Uh, and really, this marks not just the death of uh, Abdul Ghani, but also the death and, and, and fall of the Yemeni Republic. There's a whole generation that's passed on, and there hasn't been a new generation that steps up. Uh, so the uh, Republic really collapses in 2012, uh, even before the uh, final death knell of the Arab Spring on uh, the Republic. And since that moment, it's been the country has been torn apart by North and, and South elements, uh, individuals and populations that have been marginalized by the central state in Sana'a, but also internally within uh, some some of the uh, the own opposition groups within Yemen itself. Uh, so it's this uh, uh, collapse of the Yemeni state and uh, divisions that bring about the the Houthi movement. Uh, this begins uh, with uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, former president of, of Yemen, resigns in 2012 and then uh, becomes uh, or, or falls to his own machinations in, uh, it, with his death in, in 2017 at the hands of the, uh, the Houthis themselves. So uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh was the last uh, also representing that old generation and the last individual was able to keep the country together in, in uh, some form or another uh, and also very significantly uh, leaving uh, power to his second in command, Mansur Hadi, as vice president. Uh, Mansur Hadi tries, uh, albeit with uh, UN uh, pushing, uh, to uh, recreate Yemen, something that need, uh, needs to be done, uh, still needs to be done. Uh, his efforts fail, uh, and the Houthis take over the capital city of Sana'a uh, in September of 2014. Mansur Hadi escapes the capital city, uh, first goes to the southern port of Aden, uh, and then eventually escapes to Riyadh and asks the Saudis to intervene in the war in Yemen in order to stop the spread of the Houthi rebel movement. Uh, so Hadi's uh, still the international, internationally recognized president of Yemen, uh, and his government, uh, the internationally recognized government of Yemen, is limited to about 50 luxury hotel rooms in Riyadh. Uh, and uh, that uh, means that uh, here he's increasingly uh, a president without a country uh, and without uh, it, people as, as more factions withdraw from uh, what's uh, what began as a uh, Saudi uh, Yemeni coalition. Uh, in fact, the, the first uh, bombings and uh, in, in why uh, the Saudis were first invited in, they were invited in at the behest of Mansur Hadi uh, and his government in exile. Uh, but uh, Hadi's future uh, is really in doubt uh, because he retains very little power and a little popularity within Yemen itself uh, and has largely given way to facts on the ground. Now, now, what are these facts on the ground? Who are these opposition groups and what threat do they play to the Yemeni state? Uh, so the most uh, vocal and, and certainly the most noticeable group is the Houthi rebel movement. And uh, 
this uh, this movement uh, is most known uh, by its uh, slogan Allahu Akbar al Maut al Amrika al Maut al Israel Allahu Al Al Yahud al Nasr al Islam translated roughly into uh, God is great uh, death to America death to Israel uh, cursed be the Jews and victory to Islam so it's, it's certainly calling upon the old 1979 uh, uh, Iranian revolutionary uh, movement. Uh, but it's important to realize that it's not just uh, this slogan, but the Houthi rebel movement is, is really a coalition of several different opposition groups within uh, Yemen. So first, the, where does this uh, movement come from? There's a population up in the northern sections of the country that after the 1960s civil war are relegated to uh, the, the old supporters of, of the uh, centuries old imamate are relegated to the north after 1970. Uh, where for 40 years they're, they're politically, uh, socially, religiously marginalized. And uh, to, uh, the, uh, up until 2012 really had a dearth of, of any political representation uh, for the northern population. Uh, there were relatively few constructed roads. Uh, electrification was really lacking in the northern regions. And overall economic development really favored uh, the central parts of the country rather than the north. But this Houthi family itself, uh, who are they? So they first emerge uh, publicly as a religious revivalist movement. They form their own unsuccessful political party during the 1990s. And a decade later, they start this Houthi Sun'a uh, war from 2004 to 2010. There's a number of battles that are fought between Ali Abdullah Saleh's government and a uh, growing uh, popular Houthi movement. And eventually the, the movement uh, by 2010 became a, a broad coalition of the North's economic and politically marginalized groups. Uh, it became a real serious threat to the government in Sana'a. Uh, and that threat culminated uh, again with the 2014 Houthi seizure of, of Sana'a and, and overthrowing the very state that acted as their principal adversary since the 1960s. The center set, uh, uh, focus of this movement is a young uh, leader within the Houthi movement. And he's the leader by default. His, his brother was killed by the Sana'a government uh, and, uh, and his father died as well, leaving uh, this young Abdul Malik al Houthi. And by this point, his late 30s, as the central figure within this movement. And the movement itself is modeled uh, very much after Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. And uh, that's uh, because the, the Houthis uh, receive much of their training from, uh, from Lebanon. A lot of the relationships, a lot of the public relations campaigns are modeled after uh, Hezbollah. And here you see this uh, great image uh, that I often like drawing upon. Uh, is uh, on the left-hand side is Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of the Hezbollah uh, political and uh, military movement within Lebanon. Uh, and on the right-hand side is Abdul Malik al-Houthi. Very similar types of setup if you compare their speeches, their rhetoric, uh, very similar. Uh, and uh, it's intentional because Abdul Malik al-Houthi worked very closely with a lot of the, the old Hezbollah representatives in creating his uh, revolutionary movement. And in, in fact, uh, the... TV stations for Hezbollah and the TV station for uh, the Houthis operate out of the exact same TV station building in Beirut, which I visited. Uh, so they're very closely monitored by Hezbollah and work very closely with them. A, a lot of, uh, so that's the principal relationship. Uh, but since 2015, when the Houthis became not just a, a rebel movement, but really very sincere uh, or serious political movement, the Iranians have increased their interaction with uh, the Houthis, uh, increased both political support uh, and also financial and military support. Uh, so this is uh, the Houthi movement. Now, who are the Houthi movement in, uh, in themselves? That really, uh, those are in Sana'a are a very repressive government, uh, uh, far more so than Ali Abdullah Saleh ever was. Uh, a lot of their principles are anti-American uh, as, as their slogan. Uh, and uh, they also have a very racial, racist view of, uh, of Yemen. Uh, and have led, uh, amongst other things, to the uh, final exit of the small Jewish community from Yemen that had been there for over 2,000 years, uh, uh, sending them uh, fleeing because of these uh, death threats. Uh, so this Houthi movement is, is not welcomed by Yemeni Yemenis uh, who live in fear of repression, uh, murder, kidnapping, uh, and other atrocities. Uh, and their military campaign continues. The other group uh, from the south is the Southern Transitional Council. So the, the political situation in Aden, where the uh, now uh, Southern Transitional Council, STC, uh, in previously has been competing with Mansur Hadi's internationally recognized government in the southern half of the country. Uh, but in recent weeks, it, it seems clear that Mansur Hadi is even withdrawing his uh, political uh, eggs from, from the southern basket. Uh, 
Uh, and it's important to understand where does the STC come from? So after the 1967 Southern independence from the British Empire, South Yemen emerged as the Arab world's first and only communist state. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Yemeni, uh, then Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, arranged for this imperfect union in 1990 between North and South. Uh, there was a short civil war in 1994 between North and South. Uh, and what emerged is this ensuing marginalization of Yemen's Socialist Party and the Southern population uh, more generally by this Northern dominated political elite in Sana'a. Uh, so uh, from that point, from 1994 and on, there's been a, a growing voice for Southern autonomy uh, and it's culminated with this Southern Transitional Council has gained a great deal of popularity and is now calling not just for autonomy uh, within the Yemeni government, but uh, outright secession uh, and forming a Southern government uh, in Yemen. So here you have a Northern population that takes over Sana'a and a Southern population uh, that demands a secession from the centrally, uh, central Yemeni state. Uh, so both uh, in that image, ripping apart Yemen, essentially from North and South. The uh, boundaries, as uh, you, you might see them today, these were the 2020 boundaries. They've uh, scarcely changed uh, since then with uh, both the uh, Houthi uh, and Iranian uh, supported coalition in, in the Northwest, uh, and then a loose uh, group of, uh, initially they were the, the old Yemeni Republic with the Saudi coalition in the South and East, uh, but it's since been overrun by uh, STC, by a lot of local uh, Southern voices. Uh, within then. Uh, prior to 1990, uh, Yemen has never actually been a unified country. So some people refer to the North and South as, as reunification in 1990. It's in fact the first time that they've ever been united. You probably have to go back to the old Rasulid dynasty multiple centuries ago to find a, a territory that resembled this, this Yemeni uh, coalition. So it's not a natural unification, which is important to note, uh, because this may ultimately be the divisions within Yemen. Uh, Yemen uh, the unified state that collapsed after the Arab Spring and after Ali Abdullah Saleh's 2012 resignation, and uh, the one that's emerged from this uh, Houthi Republican Saudi uh, fight, uh, is uh, likely that uh, not the Yemen that's going to emerge afterwards. It certainly may be a fractured Yemen, perhaps in the best case scenario, a federalist Yemen with a north south, uh, maybe even an east region united by a decentralized government, perhaps in Sana'a. Uh, but that may ultimately be the uh, the only kind of, of result that that one can uh, can hope. So in the past uh, few weeks that both uh, Jamie and, and Congressman Hanna have mentioned is the fightings in, in the eastern region of Marib. Now, this is very important because Marib is the centrally located uh, for, or the central location of Yemen's oil resources. So it's very much uh, ties to uh, Yemeni natural resources, the ability for the state to fund itself. But it's also a symbolic uh, moment or a symbolic uh, threshold uh, for the ability of the anti-Houthi coalition to defend the rest of Yemen. Uh, meaning if Marib falls, it's very clear that the Houthi coalition is not going to be defeated by force of arms alone. So it's a very symbolic uh, moment. Uh, so the, the, the Saudis are, are drawn into the war um, by Hadi's invitation and eventually become this quagmire that they can't pull out of. What uh, is really at the core of the Saudi concern? Uh, so at the core of the Saudi concern is not uh, solely Iran, although that's the most recent uh, concern, but it's three border regions of Asir, Najran, and Jizan uh, over here. These three border regions were seized from Yemen during the 1930s and have been a sore point in, in Saudi-Yemeni relations throughout. And the, the Saudi relationship with Yemen has really been a, a concern for the uh, stability on Saudi Arabia's southern border. Uh, and specifically these three areas. Every Saudi intervention in Yemen since the 1930s has been to ensure that a strong centralized government does not emerge in Yemen to threaten Saudi and, and Gulf stability. The Houthi movement uh, draws, uh, amongst other uh, opposition groups, uh, draws upon this nationalist, uh, Yemeni nationalist movements. Uh, and uh, here's a, an image from one of the protests called the Asir movement, no to, uh, to Saudi uh, intervention or Saudi uh, occupation. Uh, and even though there have been uh, many decades since the 1930s and these three regions, uh, the population very much considers themselves Saudi citizens, Yemenis still have this sense it's, it's been a, a sore point between them. Uh, and the Houthis themselves, uh, when they first came to power in 2014, they said, well, we're going to Saudi territories. Next, we're gonna reseize these three territories. 
so obviously this became a, uh, a very alarming moment for the Saudi kingdom who sees uh, the Houthis emerging as a strong central government uh, in Yemen and one who very much declares its intentions to reseize this uh, population uh, or reseize these border territories. So whether or not this is actually going to happen, uh, but the rhetoric uh, espoused by, uh, by the Houthis is certainly something that's seen as, as threatening to, uh, to the Saudis. Uh, so much so to the point that prior to 2012, the Saudis began as already during the, the last uh, Houthi wars, the Saudis tried to intervene militarily. It was a disaster. Uh, and instead started constructing this 1100 mile uh, border zone between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Uh, only a few dozen miles were constructed by the time the war broke out in 2015. And construction largely stopped until recently. Uh, but uh, this is a major shift in Saudi-Yemeni relations because this border was very porous, uh, but now is uh, going to have a very fixed uh, border moment. Uh, so th this is important to, to understand where the Saudis are coming from. They're worried about their southern security. So a Saudi withdrawal would certainly have uh, something to do with an internationally organ international organization ensuring Saudi security. Uh, so with all this background in mind, how do we address the humanitarian uh, crisis? So the real challenge is uh, how one would deliver aid to this uh, humanitarian crisis uh, and to Yemen. Uh, what I'll argue is that the answer for Yemen is not merely an increase in aid. Uh, so uh, as of uh, middle of uh, 2020, there were 12 international organizations that had active ye uh, aid programs in Yemen, which supported everything from health, nutrition, hygiene, et cetera, uh, basically the whole gamut of civil society. Uh, just as a point of reference, in 2019 alone, there were $4 billion in aid were given to Yemen. And that equals about 10% of the country's pre-war GDP. And it constitutes uh, one of Yemen's most significant natural resources, which is not... Um, th that this uh, massive amount of aid and, and the manner in which it's uh, distributed may have actually unintentionally prolonged this conflict because it created a very lucrative wartime economy uh, that disincentivized any peaceful resolution because all the powers on the ground were making a, a, a ton of money off of this humanitarian aid, uh, both in delivery charges, fees, and just overall corruption. Uh, so there was no incentive to bring a peaceful resolution because of the amount of money that's coming in. Uh, in fact, the humanitarian assistance in Yemen lacks any exit strategies. It, it, it's, it hasn't adequately implemented any of the safeguards against dependency by local governments. And uh, most funds actually come with these strings attached. Uh, so they have to be spent very clearly according to, uh, to donor priorities, politics, uh, values. And, and certainly uh, with, with COVID, there's been a lot of money coming in for COVID, but uh, it, it's moved away from, from primary care. So it's estimated that uh, more than half of the funds donated for, for health efforts in Yemen actually never reached the clinics and, and hospitals at the end of the line. A lot of money is leaked out in the form of payments to these ghost employees, uh, padded prices for transport and warehousing, uh, and siphoning off drugs for the black market, and, uh, which often can be very dangerous. Uh, so this uh, profiteering uh, off of humanitarian aid uh, has uh, been a, a result of the, the Houthi control over the financial sector and lo local security. Uh, and uh, has enriched a great deal of local elites and, and uh, uh, is very uh, dangerous to the long-term stability within uh, Yemen. Uh, and uh, then uh, we, we asked then, uh, this is what I'll propose, is that uh, is, is this humanitarian aid really in some ways an, an orchestrated crisis? Now, now this, um, I'm, I'm hoping to engage in conversation with Congressman Khan about this because I know he believes very strongly about it, but I, I'm looking at this in, in terms of, of a, you know, a short history. Since 2014, there's been over $20.4 billion in humanitarian aid given to Yemen. A lot of it's sponsored by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, are the biggest uh, donors. So it, it seems that uh, they're they're uh, it's like the, uh, the the China the bull in the China shop, but they're paying for right. We're going to break it and we're going to cause this humanitarian disaster. But then we're going to start paying for this humanitarian aid as if it's going to whitewash what we're, we've been doing. Uh, so what I'll argue is that uh, how is uh, how much of this uh, two twenty point four billion dollars actually reaches Yemen? Right? Uh, so on the one hand, this Yemeni crisis has served as a great advertising campaign for organizations like Oxfam, uh, who place their donate now button right next to these alarmist reports about the humanitarian situation. Right? Uh, 17 million starving Yemenis donate now to Oxfam. How much of this money actually goes to the starving Yemenis? Uh, so one uh, great image which the World Food Program actually advertises on its site uh, is uh, showing you for every dollar that you give, 
36 cents are going to overhead of some sort, and 64 cents are going to, uh, to Yemenis. Now, this 64 cents actually includes everything from international uh, salaries for very expensive international workers. Uh, a very significant portion is set aside uh, of the 64 cents for travel, uh, security, the security teams that often accompany uh, all of the uh, high profile visits uh, to Yemen are uh, inordinately expensive. So it's really in the end, it's only pennies to the dollar that are actually sent to Yemen in the form of, of food aid. Now, the World Food Program is one of the best when it comes to this in terms of the massive international uh, NGOs in terms of actually uh, bringing money to the dollar. Uh, but the percentage of uh, overhead costs by other international NGOs, for instance, Oxfam is close to 70% overhead, which means only 30 cents to the dollar actually goes to support hungry people in Yemen. Right? So this is a, a massive industrial uh, or humanitarian aid industrial complex uh, that feeds off of this crisis and funding uh, these very expensive uh, and uh, very uh, in intensive uh, international organizations. The only one who really suffers in the end is the Yemeni farmer. And if, if you look at uh, what happened, it, they end up getting stuck in this vicious cycle of impoverishment because each successive year of, of food aid, for instance, being dumped on Yemen by the World Food Program and others, the, the farmers in Yemen can't compete with free food. So they don't sell their food in one given year. They can't afford to buy seed uh, or other necessities for farming in the subsequent year. And therefore their crops continues to shrink with each successive year. And the need for uh, food aid and starving uh, Yemenis increases uh, with each uh, year. Uh, and this creates uh, this perpetuating cycle uh, within each year and creates a very unhealthy donor dependency. And uh, this donor uh, dependency, how does one exit this donor dependency potentially? Uh, and uh, what I'll uh, argue, this is my last uh, point here, uh, is that perhaps the solution is localizing humanitarian aid. So if, if you look at some of the uh, organizations within uh, Yemen itself, uh, for instance, Yemen Aid was run by a fellow Yemeni American, uh, advertised on its uh, 2018 uh, annual report that they're only taking 3% uh, overhead, which means 97 cents to the dollar is actually going to, uh, to food in, in Yemen, which is a very staggering number considering the alternative. Uh, and uh, it certainly does not have the bloated INGO, uh, the international NGO bureaucracies, uh, but instead it uh, focuses really on Yemeni agency uh, and the strategic process of, of aid uh, allocation. Uh, so the uh, collaboration with other local entities, both uh, during the conflict and also in this post potential post-conflict situation, is essential to creating that self-sustaining development and stability. Right? Local organizations are able to prioritize both the long-term needs of capacity building over these short-term humanitarian responses, uh, but they can also work to replace these expensive uh, foreign personnel and instead bring in local Yemenis, uh, particularly in, in basic healthcare. So just uh, an example besides um, uh, besides Yemen aid uh, is also this, um, on the right-hand side, this uh, Yemen uh, Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. So it stands out as, as one of the few international organizations, uh, Yemeni organizations that sources food locally. So instead of bringing the food from overseas, uh, the uh, Yemen uh, Relief and Reconstruction Foundation purchases it from local Yemenis and then divides it locally within Yemen. Uh, and uh, similar, uh, similarly, Mona Relief uh, was founded by a, a Yemeni journalist and activist, uses these cash donations to purchase food from local farmers and vendors and delivers these uh, food baskets to these families in need. Uh, and uh, aside, although um, the one limiting factor, and I think it's important and one that uh, needs to be overcome, uh, is the fact that local NGOs are, are precisely that, they're local. So they have their own political divisions, but they can only uh, work within a particular area. Uh, they're limited uh, by local and regional ability, and they can operate outside of uh, their network. The one exception is ITAR for Social Development, which has a national coalition, uh, but each of these groups is, is precisely that, a local, and it's very difficult to scale, scale up. Uh, nationally. So the solution uh, in any long-term relationship with these local groups would be uh, really a, a much more intensive uh, overview of, okay, what is in Yemen? What can we work with without having to rely upon these massive food dumps from World Food Program uh, and other international NGOs? So the takeaways that I'll, I hope to just leave us with, and then uh, I'll uh, ho hope we can engage in conversation with uh, Congressman Khanna, uh, is uh, the fact that Yemen is, is really a local conflict, but not this uh, massive regional one. Uh, there's uh, the takeaway points to the fact that after 2012, there's been a collapse in, in Yemen's state legitimacy 
revolution, revolutionary generation passed on, uh, and uh, Yemen needs to redefine what exactly it is in terms of the state. What, what state will emerge? Will there be more, multiple Yemens, a federalist state? Uh, and that's something that needs to be resolved. Uh, the other piece is to understand the Houthi movement itself is a, uh, it's really a, a coalition of a lot of anti-government and northern grievances, uh, many of them economic, uh, religious, and social grievances that need to be addressed uh, with any uh, future resolution. Uh, the elephant in the room is the Southern Transitional Council, which has really taken over the southern half of the country and demands the southern uh, autonomy or complete secession from the government. Uh, so understanding and recognizing that group, it's not just about the Houthi movement anymore, but the STC is in fact an even uh, more vocal and stronger movement. Uh, the Saudi border security issue needs to be addressed as well. The Saudis have always been concerned about the, the southern border uh, and needs to have some kind of guarantee, a face-saving measure to finally pull out of this war that they should have never been dragged into to begin with, but now have no way to exit. Uh, there's an uh, overall problem of humanitarian aid being dumped on Yemen uh, and creating a very unhealthy donor dependency and harming these Yemeni farmers, uh, but also uh, addressing a broader problem, not just in Yemen, but of this massive humanitarian aid industrial complex that feeds on itself and creating this uh, hundreds of billions of dollars a year in industry uh, that may not be the best use of, of foreign aid funds and, and humanitarian aid funds. Uh, so perhaps rethinking this and instead focusing, at least in Yemen, on this aid localization uh, might present us with far better solutions to both this crisis and other crises in the future. Uh, so I'll leave with an image from my last visit in, in Yemen pre-war to Babel, Yemen. The gates of one of the greatest markets in, uh, in Yemen uh, where thousands of people come by every hour to buy every uh, need in life. And hopefully that'll open uh, up to thousands of questions as they're coming in uh, related to Yemen. We can make more sense of this. Okay, well, thank you, Professor Orkaby. Incredibly enlightening and I think a powerful analysis. I'll turn the time over to Congressman Khanna again to reflect upon what you've shared. Certainly many of the points you've made are relevant to uh, actions that he's taken in the congressional context. So any reflections that you have, Congressman Khanna, or any questions that you have for Professor Orkaby to kick off our discussion? It was a, a very thoughtful uh, presentation. I guess the question is, how would we do the localization of aid? Uh, what would be the uh, concrete mechanisms for that? Uh, how much do you think the blockade continuing is uh, contributing to the lack of uh, uh, fuel or aid getting in into the country? And I guess the third point is, I, I, I mean, I think the U.S. Uh, has to look at it from our angle and uh, our involvement in there has been the support of, of the Saudis uh, and our leverages over the Saudis. So I guess my view is I don't take seriously uh, that, the, the, that Yemen is going to somehow or the northern forces are going to invade Saudi Arabia's territory. territory. And, I mean, I know the Saudis are uh, obsessed with that. My view is if they ended the war, uh, the missile attacks on them would stop. Uh, and certainly they don't need the United States support to, to defend themselves. Uh, so I, I guess my point is uh, the United States has a tremendous amount of leverage on the Saudis. We're just uh, debating whether to uh, approve another missile sale. Uh, they're totally dependent on us. If they went to China or Russia, it would take them five to six years to switch over. Uh, and I guess the question is, and you know, OPEC, they don't have much leverage. They want to sell at a higher price anyway, it's, and they, if they don't, they're gonna lose a market share in, in the oil market. So I guess the question is why not just exert further leverage on the Saudis and get them to stop the war? So I, I think that, you know, thanks for those, that, those questions. And uh, that part of that really goes into Saudi politics in that uh, Mohammed bin Salman is, is the crown prince and certainly King Salman himself uh, can't just lay down the arms and say we lost. Uh, in terms of, of, of their own internal politics. There needs to be some uh, form of, of face-saving measure. So uh, if you look at, for, for historical models that have been used uh, before, uh, the UN Yemen Observer Mission during the 1960s created a 20 uh, kilometer demilitarized zone between uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia and its southern border. Uh, there were uh, some monitoring stations along the way. Uh, and there was one of those hotlines that uh, the Saudis could call if there was a border incursion then there would be some international inspectors that came in to see uh, what the situation is and, and file a report. So at least it was a, a stopgap measure. So I think giving the, the Saudis some kind of reassurance uh, 
that, listen, we know you're concerned about your southern border, so the UN will do something useful uh, and actually uh, put a number of peacekeepers in, you know, even if they're just uh, face-saving measures, uh, and the, Saudi the Saudis can then withdraw from the conflict and say, listen, we've tried our best, but we've gained what our initial uh, hope was to secure our southern border. It's now an internationally recognized problem, and uh, this way we can withdraw and we can uh, feel safe to know that our southern border is going to be monitored by some international organization. Right. And, and I, uh, how would they go for that, though? Uh, I mean, if you were to say lift the blockade, stop all offenses, and there's going to be a UN peacekeeping force on the border, do you think the Saudis would go for that? Again, uh, I think you, you simplify it to this extent where leverage can be placed upon them, but that will only, uh, when you corner a tiger into the uh, corner, and uh, a lot of the, the moves may be more desperate and, and ill thought. But if, uh, the Houthis can be drawn into this and said, listen, there's going to be a lot of folks who are looking at you and monitoring you and making sure that you're not uh, crossing whatever agreement it is. Uh, and in exchange, then uh, the Houthi, the Saudis will, will withdraw this blockade. And I, I think you have something there. But the blockade itself is not just, is not the only limiting factor. And if you lift the blockade, you still have the issue with the Houthis are a majorly corrupt organization uh, that is very repressive. And uh, by the, the Saudis withdrawing the way uh, that they are, you're, you're really throwing 29 million Yemenis under the bus. Uh, they don't necessarily want this government. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it'll introduce a great deal of instability. Right? So by withdrawing the, the Saudis, uh, it, there still is an internationally recognized government sitting in Riyadh. Right? All of the ambassadors all over the world are all related to this government. So. Uh, by pulling the rug out from under them without making sure that there's infrastructure under there to prevent the Houthis from taking over the country uh, in its entirety uh, very, uh, in the way that they have uh, to this point, uh, I think is, is incumbent upon uh, the international community to realize that yeah, you've started this war, you've perpetuated it, and it's important before you pull out the rug to make sure that the Yemenis are not going to be left with this kind of repressive government. So will the Saudis go well, for it? pulled out of Afghanistan yes. and the Afghanistan is left with a repressive government. I mean, the question is just, uh, you know, what is the U.S. role in, um, I mean, I obviously we support, would support then peacekeeping and other troops to uh, talks to, to try to have a civil, civilian government, but it seems to me we're being blamed in the Middle East and around the world for the support of the Saudis and the ex extrication of that I guess, why wouldn't that be in the United States' interest? To force the Saudis to end the war uh, immediately. Yeah. And ultimately, that's what it, it'll be done. But if it seems like the U.S. is trying to force the Saudis to, end, to exit this war, then you accept responsibility for events that happened on Yemen after the withdrawal of the Saudis. Uh, so uh, it, it would also require the, the internationally recognized government to lay down power. So it's not it's not only about the, the Saudis were invited in by this government. So if Mansour Hadi says, listen, we lost the war, I'm laying down power, I'm resigning, and we're resigning our government, and we'll try to focus on some kind of a coalition with the Southern Transitional Council, the Houthis, uh, the Hadramis in the East, then maybe they, they have something. But until you reach that point, uh, I, I don't, uh, it, it's, it would be very difficult for, for, the, uh, for, for that point to be made. There'll be a lot of opposition. Right. Uh, otherwise, you're just leaving uh, Yemen to uh, Hezbollah and uh, to Iran in, in some ways without giving some kind of uh, leverage for the country to, to emerge in, in a politically, uh, an equal political footing. And so it, it may be if, if you came in and, and you broke it, essentially, it, it's, your, it's your, in Saudi Arabia's responsibility to make sure it's, it's going to be fixed uh, when they leave, uh, if that's actually the case. So giving them inter that internationally recognized border would certainly be a first step into to leading towards that uh, ultimate resolution. But without that southern border security, the Saudis won't even enter into this uh, conversation. So that needs to be a starter. And that would be on the, where would that be, that peacekeeping force? I mean, it would, so you were saying it, it wouldn't include Marib or any of that. That would be seated. It would just be on the border, the peacekeeping. Yeah, yeah, just right along the border back in the old 1960s model. Uh, right along this 1100 mile border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen uh, and having monitoring stations along there. Uh, it's something that, that I personally discussed with um, with uh, Martin Griffiths uh, at some earlier. Yeah. Uh, and he says, ah, you know, that worked in the 1960s, but it won't it won't work now. Uh, but in, in speaking with, with Saudi colleagues uh, who are within the ministry itself and uh, 
that might actually have a chance of being uh, brought in is at least as something useful that the UN can do, uh, because the UN uh, various special envoys have, have done very little. In fact, Jamal Ben Omar, who was the first one, was probably very much culpable for the kind of collapse, uh, the way that the Yemeni state collapsed from 2012 till 2015. And how do you think Lender King is doing? Uh, all I know is he read my book, which uh, uh, my, my first book, uh, as he was on his flight to Riyadh. Uh, but I, I think that uh, the inability to communicate with the Houthis uh, has been a, a real uh, hampering point because the, the Houthi movement uh, is in and of itself a, a coalition of, uh, of a lot of um, issues that have come up throughout uh, this 50, 60 years of Yemeni modern history. Uh, so uh, the, the Houthi movement does have a, a very sincere voice uh, and, and one that needs to be brought into the conversation, not in Geneva or in, in some foreign government, but uh, maybe seen as an actual political party. So I think the best hope, and, and I brought up uh, Hezbollah because the, the best hope is to actually turn the Houthis rather than a militia group into an actual political movement. Uh, I think that the Houthis have surprised many observers in terms of both their ability to fight an extended military campaign uh, and also to organize politically, uh, but they don't have that international recognition yet. So bringing them into the conversation in, in some ways on equal footing uh, will also force them to take responsibility for their actions within uh, Yemen. So the key to uh, Lender King's success or any international organization is bringing in the Houthis and saying, you are now responsible for running this country, uh, or at least these Northern areas, and you need to be held accountable for the actions there. And if that is uh, the ability to do that, I think is uh, the entire success of, of this post-conflict uh, uh, campaign is going to be bringing the Houthis on and giving them that responsibility and seeing where they take it. So what, what percent do the Houthis control? And I guess, what do you see? Like, let's say when the war ends, what do you, who do you, what do you see as the government emerging? In other words, I could have told you, based on Mearsheim or others' work 10 years ago, that the Taliban was going to be the government in Afghanistan and I think there was collective denial in Washington that that was going to happen. And finally, you know, it happened. So is it as a matter of fact that whenever this war ends, the Houthis are going to largely be governing? Or is there any other conceivable uh, with the STC or is there any other conceivable scenario that's realistic to happen? So the, uh, prior to the beginning of the military campaign in 2015, it seemed that the Houthis were... Uh, trying to vie for a north-south division. Uh, there were certain talks with the STC, it was before the STC it was known as Al-Hirak al Junubi, the Southern Movement. Uh, so there's a very significant leadership over there. There's a lot of popular legitimacy. The Houthis don't have the legitimacy or the capability of ruling all sections within Yemen. Really all they want is the Northern area. They've wanted that autonomy for a long time. They want it uh, in, in, in equal footing politically. So I think the kind of Yemen that emerges is one where uh, the Houthis have a northern section, uh, the Southern Transitional Council has a southern section, and, and the eastern region uh, has been autonomous for uh, centuries. The Hadramis, the Hadramaut, has enjoyed a great deal of autonomy. So perhaps three uh, regional uh, federalist uh, sections within the same Yemen, united by uh, some decentralized government within Sana that has represented a small three groups. And that's where Mansur Hadi can so Hadi has no has. role. I mean, so basically, the Saudis would have no role in it. I mean, it'd be STC, Houthis, and this Eastern group. Yeah, well, the Saudis would have no role in this group, but they would get exactly what they wanted, a decentralized Yemeni state. Right? Uh, so uh, a central Yemeni state uh, with a very strong uh, repressive military government could be a very destabilizing factor to, uh, to the country. But having uh, one that's divided up into federalist regions within a decentralized state uh, but is a centralized state a, a realistic possibility anyway? I mean, if you're saying that the Houthis don't have the ability to control, I, I mean, I agree that obviously having a coalition agreement through peace agreement would be ideal. But is there any possibility if we just withdrew that the, the Houthis would be able to take over the country? Or would the STC in the Eastern region be strong enough that you would have ultimately three factions anyway that ultimately would have to eventually come to peace? So if you force the Saudis to withdraw, you also force them to pull back a lot of their support for the Southern groups. The STC was a creation of the Emirates in, in some ways, uh, both the, the military campaigning, uh, the arming, the, the funding, uh, was really all coming from the Emirates. Uh, and the Saudis had very similar groupings with, uh, with Mansur Hadi. So if uh, 
if they pull back, then, then that support for the Southern Transitional Council pulls back as well. And it's possible that uh, the Houthis with uh, no, uh, no blockade uh, can get far more military support from Iran and take over the country. So that uh, there is a potential if, if you pull back too quickly, uh, you play into the hands of the Houthis, then you, you, the entire country is subject to this military repressive uh, racist uh, government. And uh, that's uh, against throwing 29 million Yemenis under a bus, creating a, a rogue state within the Arabian Peninsula, which can be very destabilizing, not just for the uh, kingdoms, uh, Saudi Arabia, but also for Bab al-Mandab, the entrance to the Red Sea. Uh, there have been numerous occasions where there have been attacks on sea shipping and sea lanes, but uh, we saw what happened when there was a single ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. Uh, one can imagine the, the kind of uh, chaos that would result from instability along Bab al a very narrow strait leading into the Red Sea, could uh, have ramifications for global commerce. Uh, so it, it's in, in the world's interest in some ways to have a Yemen that emerges that is a uh, weak uh, but yet uh, stable uh, Yemen and, and one that can, can certainly be uh, coerced and moved in certain ways. The UAE is not currently still backing the STC. I mean, I, I know they've stopped their, their offensive uh, efforts there, but I thought financially and aid, they're still providing that to the STC. Uh, they, there still is a certain uh, Emirati uh, interest in, in the STC, and mainly because if you look where the Emiratis have constructed their naval and uh, an air bases, both in the island of Socotra and along the, uh, the region. So there is a, um, certainly the island and, and navigation. The Emiratis are more concerned with, uh, with occupying those island bases and making sure that they have uh, both control over the Bab al-Mandab Straits, but also a vested interest in, uh, in that southern group that's, uh, that's emerging there. So the Emiratis are still very much involved. And, and if you pull back um, everything, then the south, the south very much might collapse. They don't have the, the capacity to withdraw. But couldn't you just say, okay, the UAE can still be involved with the SDC? What percent does the SDC control? About uh, territorially, more than sixty yeah. percent of the country, but uh, probably only forty percent of the population. And the Houthis control what percent? About sixty percent of the population, but forty percent of the territory. And that eastern group then controls what? So the eastern group of Hadramis is, is only about a million, so it's a small percentage of Yemenis. Uh, but uh, Hadramis can be found all over the Indian Ocean. Uh, in fact, the mayor of Jakarta is a, a member of a um, uh, Hadrami family. So the Hadramis are also a diaspora group, but they've, they've always enjoyed their independence. They're a relatively sparsely populated Eastern region, uh, but one that, that is always uh, maintained. Is, in fact, the Hadramis are probably one of the zones of stability within Yemen, is the Eastern Hadramam region. I guess, couldn't you get the Saudis to stop the blockade? You have an international group, so you don't just have uh, military coming in. You say that the UAE can still support the STC, and that, and you have a UN peacekeeper, you know, envoy try to then bring peace. Would wouldn't that be sufficient to extricate the Saudis, but still have the support for the STC, and still have international monitoring of the uh, the ports uh, to prevent sort of the Houthis from uh going into the stc territory i mean they may take marib and you may have displacement i mean that's a huge challenge but wouldn't that by and large still keep the the 60 40 split that's assuming that the houthis won't uh, feel that they uh, have the military advantage and impetus to take over the entire country uh, so uh, the question is that if the stc uh, collapses or needs an additional military intervention uh, and the Saudis and Emiratis are called upon to fly sorties over uh, the southern half of the country because the Houthis are expanding beyond Marib uh, in the east, uh, then how do you respond to that, right? So it, it's a, it, I think it's a very thin line in terms of, uh, of Saudi withdrawal without throwing the country into the hands of Iran and to the hands of the Houthis. But in, in theory and on paper, that, that sounds like a possible solution. I think the only one that they will ultimately have, that there are three, uh, distinct regions within Yemen, uh, led by some decentralized Yemeni government with power sharing, resource sharing, uh, and uh, different, uh, perhaps different patrons, but in the end of the day, one that will uh, ultimately, neither one of which will have the ability to conquer the entire country. And there can be some uh, uneasy peace between the three regions. Well, and one last question, is a Saudi, and then, and then how would you get the aid localized? And then is a Saudi involvement right now really helping STC or is Saudi really fighting uh, 
to to prevent the fall of Marib and and to try to take back land in in, in the Houthi area. So the Saudis never really thought through the ground war. Uh, when it began, the war, the coalition began in 2015, uh, it was assumed to be, uh, it was an air war, we're going to win the air campaign. It sounds very similar to some uh, other ill-fated campaigns within history, uh, where the assumption was that some war can be won by air, uh, and that's never the case. So uh, as a, uh, a second uh, option, the, the Saudis tried to gather a coalition of groups uh, some uh, more extremist Islamist groups uh, trying to uh, act as an anti-Houthi coalition. The coalition has been, uh, th there was a Riyadh agreement in 2020 uh, that was supposed to hold the coalition together and have some power sharing with the STC, uh, but that coalition has largely collapsed. So, the, uh, and, and so has Mansour Hadi's internationally recognized government. There's very little power or legitimacy uh, in the South. Uh, so the, the Saudis are hardly holding on to, to anyone right now, which is why Madhab is collapsing the way it is. And it's why Hodaida has never been resolved as uh, because the, the different groups, uh, each one of which presents uh, a, a potential uh, anti-Houthi uh, military force, but none of which have coalesced into a national state. So the Saudis are supporting these various different groups trying to cobble together a coalition, uh, but without actually putting boots on the ground, there's no way that they can, they can stop and they don't want to. They tried that in 2009, it was a national failure, it was an embarrassment, and they won't be doing that again. So they're relying upon fighters in the ground, perhaps the Emiratis were relying upon mercenaries, right? So uh, th there needs to be some final reconciliation between the STC and, uh, and Mansur Hadi. I think that's in, in, the, the, in the, the offings. It uh, started with the, this Riyadh agreement between the two, and I think we'll, we'll eventually reach Mansur Hadi, eventually is gonna say, listen, we lost. And, and there needs to be some kind of uh, reconciliation. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, that can happen. In terms of localizing, it, it's um, Yemen actually has one of the best, uh, in the developing world, one of the best uh, local models for development. It started back in the, in the 1970s when a lot of the worker remittances would come in. So there's a, a Yemen social fund for development. So post-war reconstruction is going to be extremely important because the reconstruction funds promised by the Saudis and the Emiratis, uh, it, meaning we break it, we'll fix it, can really turn into a very... Uh, negative political patronage network. Right? We're only going to support our allies. But if it goes into some central fund and, and can be certainly scaled up by the social fund for development, a lot of that uh, reconstruction and aid can be more targeted in a local development. There already is infrastructure there uh, and the World Bank works with them, but it's a matter of scaling up uh, both uh, at this moment and also in the post-war reconstruction. Uh, to ensure that uh, Yemen's socioeconomic reconstruction happens on a much more equitable level, which will go uh, towards the long-term stability needs for Yemen. But won't that be controlled by the Houthis or it's not controlled by the Houthis? Those... So the Social Fund for Development is one of the few institutions within Yemen that's not controlled by the Houthis. There's nine different provincial groups uh, all over the country. Uh, each one of them has a degree of autonomy. Uh, and the, the SFD, the Social Fund, has... Uh, its own private banking. Uh, it's modeled very much on the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. Uh, it's uh, its own. And that uh, our aid isn't going there right now? Uh, the World Bank does uh, take some of US aid towards that, uh, but most of, of the aid is going to the large international NGOs. Uh, so mm -hmm. redirecting some of that to the local level could go a long way. Also taking uh, away a lot of the uh, in a lot of the, the financial benefit from the Houthi government. Right? If you're concerned about a central government taking money away from the money that should be going to the Yemenis, the best way to do it is to find these. Uh, and they support all Yemenis. the people in all the regions, in the Houthi regions as well, those yeah, groups? This is, there's nine different provinces, uh, provincial, provincial groups, and the Social Fund for Development has been a model for, uh, for, for success in the developing world. It's been studied uh, you know, during the 1970s and 2000s. Uh, and, and until recently, I've, I've got an article coming out now on, on the SFD and the ability for that social fund to be scaled up. Right now it's uh, in the hundreds of millions, but it can be scaled up to billions uh, and actually infrastructure uh, reconstruction. Uh, and the things and it wouldn't be, need. I mean, the Houthis couldn't say, oh, this is only gonna help the STC regions. It won't help the Houthi regions. I mean, it'll, you think it'll help all the regions. Uh, that's the hope. If, the, if history is any indication, uh, the only reason that the social fund has succeeded to this uh, date is they've remained outside of politics. Uh, and because they've had a decentralized uh, model, uh, 
So money can be allocated to the different provinces based on need uh, rather than dumping it into one central government, which would also avoid the, the challenge of legitimizing a government like the Houthis, right? Uh, where the US doesn't wanna be seen as legitimizing a government that calls for the death of America, right? Uh, it, it seems antithetical, but if you can uh, send that money more localized uh, and, and locally to the individual areas, I think that had a lot of potential to avoid a lot of the political pitfalls that would normally be associated with legitimizing a Houthi government. Now tell me anything on that, if you have that or on the- Yeah, sure. Uh, UN peacekeeper, great. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman Fana. It's been an extraordinary discussion so far. We have just a few minutes left. Thomas, I know that you had a question that you'd like to pose to both Congressman Khanna and Professor Orkabee. I just wanted to ask what role voting could possibly play in the resolution of the conflict, right? I think, uh, first of all, the various militant movements that are on the ground are probably not representative of the whole population. So when you say that uh, the Houthis control a certain percentage of the population, that doesn't necessarily mean that all the people under their control are enthusiastic supporters of them, and the same for the other movements. And uh, secondly, uh, voting also offers the possibility of a legitimate transition that you say, you know, how can you extricate yourself from the past? How can you make a new start? Well, you can make a new start by letting people vote and decide collectively how they want their country to be organized. And what they could be voting on, for example, is structural matters such as, do we want to be a federation of three parts and one state, or do we maybe want to be three separate states? And they could also vote on a certain uh, type of constitution, for example, and they could uh, create a new government. And the government, especially if I'm right with my hunch that the Houthis are, uh, wouldn't win 60% of the vote in the country, then all these different factions would have to compromise a little bit in order to attract support. They couldn't be at their most radical as they can when conflicts are being decided by force of arms, but rather they would have to be mellow out a little bit, appeal to the more moderate elements in the population of whom many are probably quite sick and tired of warfare. And uh, thereby you might diffuse the situation a bit and shift it from uh, violence and economic oppression to something more like argument and deliberation about the common good, which is, of course, sounds a bit utopian in the Yemeni context. But what do you see? What is the, the chance of anything like that happening in the next five or 10 years, let's say? I'll defer to the professor first to nice more. Uh, so I, I think my, my view on, on elections was, was slightly cynical uh, because the, the only true elections that happened in Yemen were in 1993. Uh, and the result of the election in 1993 led to a civil war because the Socialist Party did not get the percentage that they envisioned. Uh, and there was a Southern secessionist movement which led to the 1994 civil war. And so uh, there's a uh, not a very positive history of post-election uh, reconciliation. Uh, the other uh, attempt to create a national dialogue conference from 2012 through 2014 uh, led to a great deal of regional opposition because it, uh, the, both the Southern uh, movement and the Houthi movement saw the central government Sana trying to dictate what the country was going to look like based on this national dialogue conference. So it was a UN uh, funded, orchestrated and organized national dialogue conference. It was a new constitution. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the Houthi movement and, and the Southern uh, movement uh, led militant opposition groups against the Sana'a-based government. So there is a danger in, in national elections because that would then give uh, legitimacy to one central state, something that the three different distinct regions within Yemen certainly do not wanna see happen. That being said, on a local level, uh, there are proto-democracy groups uh, within a local level, both in the village level, the provincial level, that could be called upon to have representatives from each of those uh, groups. Uh, it, it's certainly one that Yemen has a long history of these proto-democracy uh, uh, groups and proto-elections. So I think provincial elections on, on a localized level might be far more successful than trying to uh, 
come up with some big national dialogue conference, which uh, may uh, not only fail to, to bring coalitions together, but uh, may actually incite greater military uh, response. But localized elections may be a, a better first step than trying to get a national dialogue going. I mean, I, I support sort of a national dialogue or, or, or uh, a voting, but I defer to the uh, experts or our, you know, or the UN envoy or whoever our experts are on how practical it is, whether it would increase violence or not. Mm -hmm. But I think at first we just need to get the cessation of, of violence and then, uh, and then look at, uh, and then I think uh, your idea, Professor, uh, could, could be a good one on how we start the reconstruction. Our last few minutes, Professor Orkaby, will you start um, with just a few final remarks and maybe a reflection on this discussion? And then Congressman, we'll turn it to you to, to finish us out. So uh, just also uh, gratitude to Congressman Khanna for the interest that you've taken in, uh, in a country that uh, where I still have many family and friends uh, where I visit and it's very dear to my heart as a Yemeni American. And, and to see the kind of interest that we've given here uh, is is really uh, very heartening, and uh, and certainly I, th I thank you and, uh, and Jamie and Professor Pope for putting this together. Uh, so the final word uh, I, I think is is to remember uh, that as easy as it is to divide the Middle East into two different camps of the Saudi Iranian camp, uh, it's not the first time it's it's been done. Uh, in fact, if you go back to uh, Egypt and um, the Egyptian revolutionary groups and. Uh, and the Saudis during the, the 60s and 70s, it's just an easy way to divide uh, a region that is far more complicated than that. But if, if we could shift our lens not to Saudi Arabia, not to uh, Iran, uh, but rather to the Yemenis themselves to see what kind of state can emerge that would give greater stability to South Arabia, uh, I think that we might find our, our solution there to, to shift the lens away from the broader uh, regional conflict and instead focus on uh, localized solutions both for politics, uh, for resolution, and also for humanitarian aid, uh, I think we can have a much uh, better and, and more equitable uh, long-term solution to the conflict in Yemen. Hey, well, thank Thomas. you. Uh, uh, thank you, Jamie and uh, Thomas for inviting me. And uh, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Orkabe for your presentation. Uh, Jamie and Thomas have my email. If you could, if you have a chance, because I'm working on an op-ed with Bernie Sanders on yeah, I mean, uh, on our amendment. If you could send me uh, just a couple paragraphs uh, on uh, one paragraph on the uh, aid on the provincial and what those regional uh, entities are called and, and, and your view on how to get aid to them. And then the second on this uh, international force uh, you know, on the border, that would be great. And, and then I'll send it to, to Bernie, see if we can get some of those points in, in the op-ed. Uh, but I look forward to, to engaging. It's obviously a very, very complicated situation. Um, and uh, while I don't have a, a, a strong view on how we bring peace there, it's a, that's a very, very difficult task. I do believe that uh, at least uh, figuring out how we can uh, minimize the, uh, the damage that the United States has caused uh, and then figuring out our ob moral obligation and reconstruction and making sure how that aid gets uh, appropriately delivered are two things that the U.S. government uh, should be doing. Thank you both for this powerful discussion. I think we're all better having listened to this exchange today and these insights on Yemen. And certainly peace remains the objective and discussions like this move us closer to solutions. I also want to thank our conference organizers, Professor Pogi, Yale University, an academic stand against poverty.